the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. That's, I'm sorry, that's a thrilling thought to me. That Jesus understands us all the way down. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day.
I was listening to the family, which is incredible. <laughs> but it reminds me of the sound of music. The, all the kids and the family can just sing so beautifully. And what a gift it is. When they first came, one of the common hymns that I realized when we were singing in church was How Great Thou Art. And that is what we're going to do today with Russian, English, and then the last verse is simultaneously Russian and English. And I think God can decipher what's going on there. So very faithful. this morning before he preaches, and may God speak through him as he brings the word to us, and what a delight he is. Greg, would you mind praying for him this morning? Lord Jesus, we just are amazed at your presence, 
We are amazed at what you do in the lives of people, how you draw them to yourselves, how you change them. You send your Holy Spirit into them to make them a new creature, not the old, a new creature. We thank you for Daniel and you bringing him into our sphere of influence through and now we can be in his sphere of influence as he influences us today. Thank you, Lord. And we just pray that extra filling of the Holy Spirit, Daniel, that he might be given clarity of thought and uh, transmission to us. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name. I will start from Russian, so you will know how hard it is to listen to so many foreign language. Доброе утро. Благодарю Бога, что мы все можем здесь находиться и прославлять Бога, вникать в Его Слово. Я хочу прочитать текст, записанный в Матфея, 14 глава, с 22 по 33 стих. И тотчас понудил Иисус учеников своих пойти в лодку и отправиться прежде Его на другую сторону, пока Он отпустит народ. I'm reading the text from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. И отпустив народ, Он зашел на гору помолиться наедине, и вечером оставался там один. А лодка была уже на середине моря. И ее била волнами, потому что ветер был противный. В четвертую же стражу ночи пошел к ним Иисус, идя по морю. И ученики, увидев его идущего по морю, встревожились и говорили, «Это призрак!» и от страха вскричали. Но Иисус тотчас заговорил с ними и сказал, «Ободритесь, это я, не бойтесь!» Петр сказал ему в ответ, «Господи, если это ты, повели мне прийти к тебе по воде». Он же сказал, «Иди!» И, выйдя из лодки, Петр пошел по воде, чтобы подойти к Иисусу. Но, видя сильный ветер, испугался и, начав утопать, закричал, «Господи, спаси меня!» Иисус тотчас простер руку, поддержал его и говорит его, ему, «Маловерный, зачем ты усомнился?» И когда вошли они в лодку, ветер утих. Бывшие же лодки подошли, поклонились ему и сказали, Истина ты, Сын Божий. So I wanted to preach about faith and miracles in our lives and practical faith in God, growing in faith. I would like to start with reading this text from the Bible. It's Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. <clears throat> we all know that all that Jesus has done and continues to do today is absolutely correct and the best for us. 
we know that Jesus came and preached about the kingdom of heaven. And we also know that Jesus' goal was to, to save us, to save people through their faith in him. After the reading of this text, I had some questions about this text. Why did Jesus let this situation happen? Jesus doesn't happen in situations the way we do. He knows what is coming. What purpose did he have for this situation? Why did he want to accomplish in what did he want to accomplish in the hearts of his disciples? Was it good that Peter asked Jesus to let him walk on the water? Do we respond the same way Peter did? Do we ask God to do strange things like walking on water? Is it good or right to ask God for a miracle in our life? Do we need miracles in our lives to make our faith better, to strengthen our faith? Do we need miracles to, to have that in our lives? <clears throat> one day, one day I asked God about this. I prayed, Lord, please give me a car. I don't have any money to buy a car, but I need it. I need a car. I want to serve you. You know that, that I want to serve you. And I think, I'm sure that the car will help me to serve you better. Wouldn't you think so? <laughs> and after, after, that, after that prayer, I went to Poland to buy a car. And on my way back, the car broke down. It looked like this, even even more smoke, I would say. <laughs> so the engine started to run on maximum power, and I couldn't get to it to turn off. I was about 18 years old. I had almost no money. I had almost no warm glass with me, and I was in the forest of foreign country and I didn't know the language, Polish language. So now, this virus definitely helps me to learn God's things, to, to get closer to God, to trust Jesus and not trust in myself. In that moment, I was learning to show God in prayer. Before this, uh, for a couple of years, I had been asking God to teach me to trust in Him and not in myself, but I didn't think that God would teach me this through my everyday life. And I definitely never expected that God will use my old car master to do so. <clears throat> we see in the Gospels that Jesus more than once tested the faith of his disciples, right? And since he is God, he orchestrates all circumstances and, and all the laws of nature. It wasn't hard for him to create situations that, that will test the faith of his disciples. It is interesting that Jesus often uses everyday situations for this. For example, uh, people, when people are hungry, they simply need food. That's what we need every day. But when Jesus told his disciples as they stood before a crowd of the 5,000, you give them something to eat. That's what he said to his disciples. He was waiting to see if one of them, one of his disciples, had the faith to say, we will. If you said that, we can do that. We are able to do so if you said this because you are our Lord, you are God. <clears throat> Let's look at the other situation Jesus had. We read about this in the Gospel. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. 
and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? <clears throat> so Christ was sleeping in the boat while the waves threatened to take a thunder. Jesus had said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And now he is sleeping and waiting for one of his disciples to remember those words and, and say, If Christ said that, then we will make it there, right? Mm. Do you think that if the disciples had said that, maybe even the sea would have come down and Christ would have continued sleeping? <laughs> Christ wants us to trust his work completely. He tests our faith to make it stronger and resilient. I don't know this work, but Jenny said that everybody knows it except me. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Only through testing, our faith can gain strength. And that's his goal. Faith and complete trust in the hearts of his disciples. And we are his disciples too. I'll tell you another story. In the Bible, I have read Jesus' words like, Go and preach the kingdom of God. You know those phrases. Or love your neighbor as yourself. And so on. But I don't always notice where I can trust those words in my everyday life. Once, <clears throat> this is another story. Once when I had just received my mother, steel mother, from the Russian soldiers who had confiscated it two weeks earlier, the Lord Jesus tested my faith. <clears throat> when they confiscated it, it was because I was headed home at about 9.15 p.m. and curfew started at 9. So when I was headed home from our church at about 8.15, I was in a little hurry. And, but if I drove like Russian, I could get there in 10 minutes. And I did drive like Russian. And that was fine at that moment because nobody cared about it. <clears throat> As I drove through the center of our town, there was no one but one older gentleman who was waving at me and yelling, stop, stop, and give me a ride. Was he my neighbor or not? <laughs> Actually, there was no other neighbor for me at that moment. But I didn't have time to take him where he was going. I didn't even have time just to stop and so he could get in the car because I was in a hurry. <clears throat> so I sped past and the guards at a roadblock stopped me just 200 feet down the road. Right there. Imagine, instead of that military truck, there was my mother. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so soldiers checked my documents and I could see in the mirror that the gentleman was still running and calling out to me. I thought to myself, I wish they, they would hurry up with the documents and I could get out of here. And then soldiers asked me this, is he calling you? I told them that I don't know him and they let me go through. But I didn't get another hundred feet down the road when another soldier stopped into the middle of the street to stop my car. They asked me, is that man running after you? I told them that I don't know, but they said, he's definitely running to you, go back. And so in one minute, my new elderly friend opened the door and jumped into my car and said, wow, God help me. 
<clears throat> of course, I always remember those words. Like, there is no other commandment greater than this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, I heard the voice inside telling me, stop and pick that older gentleman where he was going. Because you know, that's what Jesus wants you to do. But I didn't want to risk losing my car again. Because I, I just had the story a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> God wanted me to trust him in that situation and wanted me to fulfill the commands of Christ. He was tasting my faith. <clears throat> it is very important to the life of a Christian to have a living, growing faith. This kind of faith allows us to trust God in any circumstance that life throws at us. It gives us the confidence to trust His promises that we have, that we have from His holy world. This is exactly why Jesus Christ put his disciples in these kinds of situations all the time. Situations where their faith was tried. <clears throat> so was it good that Peter asked Jesus to allow him to walk on the water? He was asking for a pretty big miracle, right? Even Moses never walked on the water at least as far as the Bible. Is this the same thing as when the Pharisees asked for signs from heaven or when King Herod wanted to see Christ who was under arrest so that he could see some kind of miracle from the famous preacher Jesus? Of course Peter's request was very different I think. Did Jesus judge Peter for that request? I don't think so. Did Christ say something like, I am the Lord and I can walk on water, but you, you stay in the boat, you can't walk on water. <laughs> no, he didn't. It is likely that this is just what Jesus wanted for Peter to come out and walk on the water. What do you think? Would Jesus have been glad to see all of his disciples coming out of the boat to meet him? I think so. I think so. Have you ever felt like you need to get out of the boat and walk in the water to come to Jesus? Is it hard to take the first step? I know, it is very hard to take the first step. <clears throat> Another story. About two weeks ago, at Drake and Carlin's home, we had a major reorganization of beds. They took two beds out of my room and brought a bed into my room that was about this tall. <laughs> and when we were putting this bed together, Drake told me, mm, you are going to need a leg up <laughs> to get into bed. <laughs> Of course, I asked him, what does that mean, a leg up? Drake explained this phrase to me. So the next morning, I thought about this. We need to give each other a leg up to, so that we can get out of our boats and make our steps toward Jesus. A step of faith is always a hard step to take, you know that. If you see someone that is having a hard time getting out of his boat, if you see someone that has that is having a hard time trusting God, give him a letter. Strengthen his faith. Encourage him. Tell him about how God has helped you take the difficult step out of your boat. Remind him that God is always faithful. He won't let you drown. I don't know this word. He won't let you 
sin, he won't let you go under the water, right? Praying for someone can also be a let up. I remember Jesus prayed for Peter's faith in Luke 22, 32. So the next question, is it okay to ask God for a miracle? Is it good to pray and ask God, like, give me a miracle so it will strengthen my faith? I prefer to pray this way, Lord, teach me how to trust you or strengthen my faith. Because you know better how to do that. God knows better how to do this. He knows me better than even I know myself. He knows what would be the best for me, what will really strengthen my faith, and what will really teach me to trust God and not in myself. I don't want to be like the Pharisees that ask for signs from heaven or like the rich man that was convinced that his brothers would only believe if someone comes back from the dead. Remember that story. <clears throat> In John 20:29, 20, we read, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I want to believe the Lord without miracles. I don't want to be like King Herod who wanted to find Christ only to see what kind of signs and wonders he could do. Miracles are not the most important tool to strengthen and, and form our faith. The Bible tells us that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That's in Romans 10, 17. But I have asked God for many miracles in my life and I will continue to do so. Just a few weeks ago or maybe a few months ago, we all asked God for a miracle that he would get the Shubakos across the border and God answered our prayers, right? But in James 4, 3, the Bible says you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. If I ask God for my own purposes, if I don't think I have enough, like we heard from Jason last Sunday, that doesn't strengthen my faith, right? It doesn't help. But, but if I ask God for other people, that is good, that is good. Don't think about yourself, but think more about others. <clears throat> ask God to do miracles for others, and that is the right way to ask. I think that our prayers are full of requests for ourselves, but how often are our prayers full of the needs of others, for the needs for our friends, for our loved ones, for our family, for our church family, legacy family. <clears throat> this is the, the last verse I read. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Our faith and God's miracles in our lives, or even our daily trust in God, challenges people to praise God believers and unbelievers alike. This strengthens the faith of others or helps faith to arise where it wasn't before. God uses us not only to perfect our faith, but for people around us too. I don't know what caused the biggest impression on the other disciples, that Christ was walking on the water or that Peter took a few steps. I think that the disciples may have been so used to the miracles of Christ that sometimes they didn't even notice them. The passage that recounts the story of the feeding of the 5,000 tells us, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. 
Here is another interesting thought I had. We must notice miracles, small and great, any miracles that God gives us. We shouldn't receive everything from Christ as he must give us or do for us as we wish. This is his love, this is his mercy. We should appreciate it. But the disciples knew Peter very well, and they knew that he was a normal, normal person just like them, right? But here Peter is walking on the water. The one that was crying out with fear, saying that there was a ghost coming on the water, was now walking on the water himself. So our sin trust is good even if it is a childlike faith in Christ. It is often accompanied by miracles, surprising stories, and amazing answers to prayer. This is a good food for our faith and the faith of people around us. <clears throat> I'll tell you another story. I heard about it when I was in Ukraine. A few years ago, there was a family of believers whose home burned down. It all happened in a town called Marifa about six months before the start of the war. This town is about a hundred miles from Kupiansk, from my city. The house burned down at night and was completely destroyed. The parents and children escaped only with their lives. The next day, the bro brothers and sisters from the church tore down the remaining pieces of the structure. Only the foundation remained. In two weeks, a new brick home already stood on that foundation. Walls, roof, windows, doors, electrical plumbing, and even the finishing touches inside and out. They even had furniture inside. Every day, many of their neighbors walked by this new house and were amazed at how believers came together to help that family. They gave glory to God for that they saw. More than about 50 people were personally acting in the building of this home. One unbeliever, when he saw how the believers helped each other, gave two rams to help feed the workers. Another person saw the brothers at the Ukrainian version of Home Depot buying supplies for the house. He asked if they were buying supplies for that house that was burned down. When they said they were, he paid for a large part of their purchase. This, this story shows us a different aspect of faith that we can read about in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7. I will read it, and there is some difficult words for me, but I will try. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and Godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. I remember this, these verses in Russian. <coughs> Don't understand it in English. <laughs> I believe it's true. <laughs> but when we find ourselves in these kinds of situations that this family found themselves in, situations where we lose everything and we continue to trust God, we can repeat the words of Job. Remember, he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what Job said. Then God truly receives the praise and honor through these circumstances. God is strong enough to turn any great loss into a great blessing for us and for those around us. We just need to trust Him. So, at the end, I, I, I would like to say this. 
May God bless you as you grow in your faith. As you see God's hand at work, as you notice His miracles every day. May God bless us as we receive difficult situation as from His hand and always remember that it is for our good. It helps us to be perfected in faith. Let's help each other to trust God in everyday lives. May God use our faith for the salvation of others and for His glory. Amen. 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 Am I praying? <laughs> I pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for you that you are the only God and you saved us through our faith in you. And I'm so thankful that you help our faith to, to be more stronger. Thank you for this. Please help us to, to help each other to grow in faith, to, to be perfected in our faith, to live for your glory. In Jesus' name I ask you this for Amen. Aren't you thankful this morning? I know you have been blessed as I have. God is so good. He is an extraordinary young man. 25 years. Wow. Incredibly mature in Jesus. And so I pray that you would over this week and over the weeks to come, that you would remember the Sherbuko family. Ask them for, uh, pray to God that they would grasp English language, continue to have health and, and guidance to move forward for Jesus, and that uh, we would be a blessing to them to show our faith as they have blessed us here. So have a wonderful Lord's Day. Hug some people, and we'll see you next week, Lord willing. Thank you.